morning, and once again, we want to welcome you to our worship service here, for those of you who are present, as well as those who continue to watch us online. The altar flowers this morning are in memory of Austin and Adeline Elkin, and they're given with love by Willard and Mary Ann Coe. I have several uh, announcements to share with you. Um, this past week, another little baby was born into our community this week. Uh, Josh and Ashley Carroll are the parents of a little boy named Jude Connor Carroll. And they're home, and, and Jack is carried away with him. And so that's good, as well as his grandparents on both sides. Susan Zuccarell had her surgery and came home the same day and is doing nicely, and we're grateful for that. Also, we want to extend Christian sympathy to two families this morning, one to Sandra Gross and the loss of her brother, Frank Talley. I knew Sandra's brother. He used to work with Jimmy and did a lot of work around our house. And so we ask that you remember Sandra and the loss of her brother. And always remember that if you choose to send Sandra a sympathy card, uh, always remember when it says a post office box, they do receive their mail at that post office box, and that's correct. And also, we want to remember Marlene Long and the loss of her niece this past week who died suddenly as well. Uh, we want to remember uh, the family of Donna Heron. And also, this week, Faye used to sing with Pat Smith, Charlotte's sister, who has now gone on to be with God, and um, Lou Ann Runner. And this past week, her son, Luann Runner, was at home and fell, just fell on the floor. And he is quite young, and they have taken him to Greenview Hospital and have been running a battery of tests on him. So we ask that you remember uh, Mason Runner. And also, Charlotte remains in uh, Greenwood Rehab and continues to make progression. Also, today is Transfiguration Sunday. And Wednesday marks the beginning of Lent, Ash Wednesday. Now, this year, because of COVID, we're not actually going to do an Ash Wednesday service. But if the weather permits, we'll continue our study uh, in the Gospel of Mark, picking up after verse 30 and continuing through the feeding of the 4,000 in chapter 8. And that's the Bible study that is uh, Wednesday at 6, Thursday morning at 10, and always remember, they're in the sanctuary here, plenty of social distancing available. And also the children and the youth meet at the same time if you'd like to bring your children. Always being sure that children are in Heritage Hall, plenty of social distancing at each table. Are there other announcements or other concerns this morning? If not, as we begin worship, once again, I want to welcome you, whether you are present or whether you are watching us online, as we gather this morning and celebrate the gift of God's love that we have received as we have shared that gift with others. I want to thank our church this morning for its faithfulness and the many ways behind the scenes that we have continued to reach out and to love others during these difficult days. And there are more than I could mention this morning. You have continued to show your love for God and for others. So as God's grace and love and mercy are poured out on us each day, may the power and the love and the grace of God call us and challenge us to do more. Will you join with me as we worship?
Father God, you provide all things for us. Certainly you have given us all that we need, and we are so grateful that we get to partner with you and give to so many that don't have the basic needs of life. We realize, our Father, that every good and perfect gift comes from you. You are the one who gives us grace, who gives us hope. So this morning, as we begin this hour of worship, we pause to give you praise, honor, and glory. And to that we say, amen and amen. Good morning, church. And I have to say, sweet church, because we certainly have had enough candy around here for this, this week. And happy Valentine's Day to all of us here and to all of you at home. And I hope on this cold and waiting for the weather to come in day that you are warm and that your hearts will be warmed by the, some of the songs that we sing. Because Corinthians 13 talks about love. You know, that's the love chapter. And it says faith, hope, but what is the greatest of these? Love is the greatest of these. And that's why we're going to be singing all about love this morning as we sing, Love Lifted Me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. something love when they reach out lifted our spirits and lifted us but the best love comes from our heavenly father because oh how he loves you and me he gave his life for us because he loves us and we love him
it is this love that the Father sends down through us that we give out to others and we share his love. and happy Valentine's Day. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank everyone for their support of the Valentine's Day fundraiser. It was a lot of hard work, but um, it's only because you guys really overwhelmed us with your support, and I am very grateful for that. Thank you to everyone who helped in any way, whether it be an idea or supplying it or help making it or help delivering it. We wouldn't have gotten anywhere without any of you. So, um, <clears throat> for our Children's Education Incorporated, uh, our next meeting is Tuesday at 6. Um, we've made it through the fundraiser, so we can have a meeting now. All right. So, our lesson, Monopoly, the game that ruins relationships. <laughs> now, as you can see, this is my wife's version. It is sealed, so our marriage is thriving. <laughs> but Monopoly, there's a lot of anger in Monopoly because the name of the game is to get as much money as you can, no matter how many people you upset, right? And even though it is colored money with this ridiculous mustache man on it, it still feels good just thumbing through it. it. Makes you feel a little powerful. Um, but Jesus talks about material things and he says 
What good is it for a man to gain the whole world but lose his soul? Now, if there's ever a quickest way for someone to lose their soul and compassion for one another, it's when they're winning at Monopoly. But it's true in the world, too. Sometimes we lose track of what's important, and we're only focused on getting the newest thing, the newest toy, um, the most candy, whatever it may be. Now, here's the difference. Monopoly and the world around us is about taking, it's about getting. Whoever has the most stuff is the best, or the coolest stuff or the most expensive stuff. But Jesus is about giving. And what I mean by that is when Jesus is telling the story, he's telling the people that they have to give up everything to follow him. But it's, it's more than that. Once you start following Jesus, you still have to give. You give love. You give your time. You serve people. But it makes the, the world around us a better place following Jesus. Being givers instead of takers. It's not going to win you Monopoly games, but it will win your faith. Okay, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to gather here. Um, I pray that as we go throughout our week, um, instead of looking for what we can get, let's look for opportunities to give. In your name we pray. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of John, the fifth chapter, verses one through nine, as we give ear and attention to God's word. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for the feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem near the sheep gate a pool, which is in Aramaic called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five colored covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me in the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And at once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. Let us pray. O oh God, we ask now that all the meditations of our hearts and the words of thy servant find acceptance in thy sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. For it's in his holy name we humbly pray. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning is pretty straightforward. It's about Jesus entering into Jerusalem and healing a man that is lame. And he's going to do it not by conquering him with great power, but he's going to heal him with steadfast love. You all probably remember this because the bulk of you have lived the entirety of your life in Kentucky. And you're going to remember that in 1925, there was a man by the name of Floyd Collins, and if Jeff will put him up there on the screen for us. Floyd Collins was an, and he's down in that cave, trap. He was an avid caver, and he was exploring some of the aspects of Mammoth Cave. And while he was there exploring the cave, there was a shift in the rocks, and he became pinned, trapped, and he was absolutely stuck. They were able to get down to him slowly and provide him with some resources, but they were not able to free him without trying to find another way to dig down to him. Unfortunately, as they were trying to do that, some other stones shifted, and they were no longer able to get 
to Floyd Collins. This became a media phenomenon long before Facebook or Twitter, and there were thousands that gathered. It became the th third largest media event between World War I and World War II in the United States. Everybody tuned into their radio every single night and every day to hear the attempted rescue of Floyd Collins. Well, after two weeks, they were almost able to get to him. But unfortunately, by the time they did, Floyd Collins had died. They were not able to rescue him. They were not able to get there in time, and he didn't make it. For several weeks, though, the world's attention had been focused on this one man who was trapped. And I want you to think with me this morning. There are people all around us, around you, who are trapped, stuck all the time. And sometimes we don't even seem to notice it. People who are trapped by despair, by depression, by hopelessness. People who are trapped by addiction. People who are trapped by a lack of resources. People who are trapped in all different kinds of circumstances. And in the midst of being caught and stuck and trapped, they need help. They need to be rescued. They need to change which I think raises the question for us, how does change happen? Well, I found what I read once by a professor at Princeton Theological Seminary, what he said about change and transformation. He said that in change and transformation, there are always three reliable patterns for that to occur. There's vision, there's intentions and their needs. In other words, you have to be able to see it, you have to want it, and you have to have the ability to do something about it. Let me give you a non-religious example at first. Let me say that you're sitting here and you decided that you wanted to learn a foreign language, perhaps French. And you have a vision of sitting down and ordering a chocolate croissant in a cafe in Paris. You have the intention of moving things around in your calendar. You put a poster of Paris maybe up in your office to inspire you to learn. And the means that you're going to learn French, the resources are the books, the tutors, and the classes that you engage yourself in that will bring about the transformation in you to learn a new language. In other words, when you think about what it means to change, I want to suggest to you that those three elements are always present. Which brings us to our scripture text for this morning. When you look at the paralyzed man who had been laying and doing by the pool of Bethesda. He had been doing the same thing for decades. And the reason he hasn't changed is because there is a lack of vision. He's been doing this 38 years. There's a lack of intent. Did you hear what Jesus asked him? Do you want to get well, Jesus asked. And it seems like a rude question, but really Jesus is getting at the heart of what he desires or he doesn't desire. And then there's a like of means. In other words, the paralyzed man has more excuses than he has friends. He has more prayers, he has more excuses than he has, and he is unwilling to do anything about it. But here comes Jesus. And Jesus comes into this situation with a different vision, a different intent, and different means. And you see, Jesus, we know, came to usher in the kingdom of God, and his intent 
is to heal this paralytic man in the city of Jerusalem. And his means to do it is his resurrection power. In fact, when Jesus speaks to the man and says, get up, the verb in the Greek is the Greek word for rise, which is the same word that is used when someone rises from the dead. So as this astute Princeton professor concluded, he made this conclusion about change. And that is that God is mysterious, but the process of change is not. You and I need to understand that when you and I are dealing with change, you're dealing with some aspect of your life that often is incredibly mysterious. When in reality, when you break it down, it's the kind of thing that happens all the time. In other words, you can change. People can change. If their vision is clear, if their intent is strong, and the means are available. And I like because Jesus himself illustrates this for us in one of the great commandments. And, and that professor at Princeton connected it this way. He said, when you hear the great commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. In other words, he says the vision's clear. Your mind and your imagination. The intent is strong. In other words, it's your feeling with all your heart and its desires are available. Your soul and strength. And this is how change can occur. But listen carefully. Don't think that I am simply reducing change to these three elements as though if you follow this pattern or this prescription, you can change anything. No, no, no. But I do challenge you to think, however. Think about any significant change that has occurred in your life. And let me ask you, were all three of these elements present? You see, you have to see, he says. You have to want it. And you have to be able to do something about it. And if all three elements or dimensions of that are present, we can change. I know this because I read an interesting story about a woman by the name of Crystal Jones who decided that after she graduated from college, she was going to work with first graders. And she discovered that for most first graders, she discovered that how important it was for them to get through the first grade. And believe it or not, for children who did not get through the first grade without the ability to read, it was the one number one most predicting factor of whether or not they would end up so oftentimes in trouble. And so as a teacher, after she graduated, she caught a vision. And she shared that vision the day that her first graders entered into her classroom. She says, by the end of the year, I'm going to make you a third grade reader. And their eyes got big as saucers. Because all first graders know how important and big third graders are. And in fact, she did exactly what she said. She began to share with those first graders her love for learning, and she began to teach them the mechanics of reading, and she taught them to be curious. And the third thing she did, she created all kinds of means, not only in the classroom, but at home with their parents, 
and she created many other different ways for those little first graders to learn how to read. But you know, if she has, before you know it, she was successful. And when those little first graders go through her class, most every one of those children are able to read at a third grade level. And statistics show because of that, their destiny and their life is forever changed. And all of that occurred from a woman who had a vision and an intention and a means to do something about it. Which brings us back to our text. Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and asked, Do you want to get well? Because you see, the reality is, sometimes we prefer the disability that we know to the ability that we don't know. Sometimes in life we prefer the limitations that we have to the lack of limitation we don't have. Jesus is questioning, you see, he's questioning the intent of the paralyzed man. I love the way Max Licato writes about this text. And by the way, if you don't realize by now, I have Max Licato's morning devotional app on my phone. It's the reason I quote him so often. And this is what he writes about this text. When Jesus asked the man, do you want to get well? He says, do you want to get sober, solvent, educated, better in shape, over your past? Do you want to get beyond your upbringing? Stronger, healthier, happier? Would you like to leave Bethesda in the rearview mirror? Are you ready for a new day and a new way? Are you ready to get unstuck, dislodged, pride free, set loose, let go, unshackled? He says, life feels stuck when it makes no progress. When you battle the same discouragement you faced a decade ago or the same fears you faced a year ago. When you wake up each morning to the same hang-ups and habits, you realize that Bethesda has become your permanent mailing address. When you feel as though everyone gets to the pool before you and nobody wants to help you. That's the condition of this man. He thinks no one wants to help him. And you heard in the text, he says, and someone always gets there before I do. I think like the man who sits at the pool for 38 years, there are many of us who are trapped, we're stuck. We are paralyzed. And in the midst of all of that, we ask, what can be done? There was a woman I knew who was married for over 60 years. And they were very challenging 60 years of marriage. Because the man that she was married to, he struggled significantly with mental illness. He had deep, deep bouts of depression, stays in the hospital, even several attempts to commit suicide. As his wife, Ruth, struggled with him all these decades, she knew that she needed to become a different kind of person in order to help the one she loved. So she knew that she could not do that on her own. She knew she could only do that with God. And so what she did was, was that she committed her life to loving her husband who had mental illness no matter what. And in the midst of that, she also knew that she needed a resource that she could draw off of. For her, it was prayer. For her, it was a particular kind of prayer. 
her prayer took the form of a song. She loved to sing the great hymns of the church. She loved to study those hymns, and she loved to take the words of those great hymns of faith to heart. And one time she was sharing with me about her husband, how he was struggling, struggling deeply later in his life. And she said no matter what the moment was, when her husband was in distress, in order for her to become non-anxious about her husband's mental illness, she said, every time I listen to the music in my ears, and I would sing one of the great hymns of the church. And she said, what those great hymns of the church did for me in those moments when my husband struggled the greatest with his mental illness, it reminded me as I sung that I am never alone and that God is always present with me. Maybe you're like Ruth. Ruth realized she couldn't change her circumstances. She couldn't change her husband's struggle with mental illness. But there's one thing that she did have. She had the ability to do something else. She had the ability to change herself. She had the ability through the singing of the great hymns of the church to let those hymns become a prayer and an anchor for her soul. Boy, did she change. She became the rock by which love shows how you can flourish when many people's love for their mate would have faded away. You know, I always like to end sermons on high notes. But this scripture text this morning doesn't let me do that. It doesn't afford me that privilege. You see, most of the times when we preachers read John 5, we stop where I stopped earlier. But this is not where the story or the text stops. You see, in the text that follows, beginning in verse 10. You will read that the religious leaders get upset because it's the Sabbath day and Jesus has healed this man and this man has no idea who Jesus was and they start to inquire from him and he says, I don't, know, I don't really know the man's name. Read it on when you get home. That's how the text ends. The man who was healed had no idea who it was who healed him. Because it says immediately after he was healed, Jesus slipped away in the crowd. But later in the text, it says, And Jesus found him at the temple and says to him, You are well again. Stop sinning. Worse or something worse may happen to you. And this is a part of the story we would rather not explain. And yet I believe it's a part of our lives that we need to know and understand. Jesus ends this story. John ends his story with a warning. And what Jesus is trying to get this man who laid by the pool of Bethesda for 38 years, who was physically healed, he says, you know, there is something worse, more debilitating than any disease. And you know what that is, beloved? And that is, is when we harbor a persistent, consistent life of sin. It's so hard for us to imagine what could have been worse than a man who had laid paralyzed by a pool for 38 years. But Jesus says, oh, there actually is worse. 
because you see Jesus wanting him to understand and for us to get it that God created you and me and everyone in humankind so that we might respond to his healing grace and live in a relationship with him. And what happens if we rebuke Jesus, if we resist Jesus, if we remain in our rebellion and our brokenness and in our sin? Jesus wants us to know that there is a life worth living out there for all of us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth him, whosoever respond to him in faith shall have everlasting life. Jesus healed the man's physical ability but the dangling invitation for him and even for us if we don't turn away from our life of sin and walk toward God in faith and love and trust so that he can get to know and love us and we get to know and love him then there's far worse things in life than being physically disabled. In closing, there's one important detail that I do not want you to miss in this story. The place just north of the temple in Jerusalem, it is called Bethesda. And in Hebrew, you know what that means? It means house of Hesed, steadfast, love. The man had been coming to the house of steadfast love, to a pool of renewal for almost four decades. And if you don't get anything else I say this morning, then understand that Bethesda is not a place. Bethesda is an invitation to a relationship with a person. The person who will usher in new life for you, that person who will usher in and reconcile all creation unto himself when all disease and all mental illness and all troubles are done away with. And bring a time where there will be no more pain, no more crying, no more tears, and no more sin. I don't know what your paralysis is. I don't know what you're dealing with in your life that causes you to feel stuck and trapped and paralyzed. But this is what I do know that it can only be, it can be just a temporary position if you will respond to the invitation that Jesus Christ extends to you, that God extends to you and Jesus Christ. Lay aside that life of sin and rebellion and listen to what Jesus said to the paralytic man. Rise! Stand up. Pick up your mat, Jesus says, and walk. If you're like the paralytic man who has been lying at the pool of Bethesda, hear the invitation that God issues to us through Jesus Christ. Let him raise you up in the power of his love from death to life, as he did the paralytic man in our text. Give your life to Christ. Walk daily with him in love. Let us pray.
Father, you are still rescuing your people. Even though we are trapped in the darkness and brokenness and sin of our lives, yet you still desire to save. Lord, help us to heed the warning of the things that might be worse than our physical limitations. We know that you are making all things new and that you're just not conquering Jerusalem long time ago, but you are conquering our lives with your steadfast love. So Father, in these moments, help us gather around the reality of your healing presence, your piercing questions. Give us the vision, the desires, and the ability to change, to change ourselves, and the community around us. For we pray all of these things in the strong and mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our hymn of consecration this morning is, I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice. Draw me closer, closer, closer to thee. This morning, I realize that some of you from home may need to respond. And if you do, I hope you'll just bow where you are, in your home, in your PJs, and know that with vision, intent, and means, God has given you everything that you need to bring about the change in your life. If you're here this morning and you want to make that change that you desire for your life public. I invite you to respond as our praise team sings, I am thine, O Lord, as we stand and sing. Well, I got it wrong. Change my heart on God. <laughs> comes to Rust to Kroger or Myers or Walmart and get you some groceries, but the crowd has already beat you. It looks like we are going to have bad weather. So get home, stay safe, stay warm, and if you need help, give us a call and we'll do the best we can to help you. Let us unite our hearts together as we once again keep praying this same benediction. And by the way, it's found at the end of the book of Hebrews. Will you join with me? Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, 
through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen.